Hi guys, Isaac again. I don't know really why I introduced myself at the start of these. You've probably learned my voice by now. Um, shoot, here we go. Right, this is the one. Is the paper I'm looking at? Yeah, okay. So here I'm running through Wednesday's multiple choice paper. Um, again, as I said, I'm going to be going through a variety of different papers. Uh, you know the score by now. Let's just get on with it. Uh, question one. Which statement about efficiency is correct? So four simple statements here. Allocative efficiency occurs when marginal revenue equals marginal cost. We know that's not true. <laughs> An economy is productively efficient when it is producing at a point where its product is busy from curve. Well, we know that's the definition of productive efficiency. It's where you are. <coughs> Sorry. We know that productive efficiency means that uh, you have no spare capacity. You're using every um, resource available in the economy. And therefore, uh, we can say that um, when it's producing on a productive possibility curve, it's using all the resources available, therefore productive efficient. So we know that the statement is correct. Question two. Here we have a production schedule. So we know uh, a consumption schedule. Sorry. So we know that this is the utility given how many units consumed. And if they get two units of utility from the last dollar spent, she spends on each good that she purchases. So, so we know that the marginal utility of saving a dollar is um, two. So what's the maximum number of units of X that she will consume if the price is five? So five units, she's producing four. We know she's getting um, 20. Sorry, I've lost my, completely lost my train of thought here. That's what happens when you have a blue jab, as I was saying. So the consumer obtains two, let's just go through this again, two, two units of utility from the last dollar she spends on each good that she purchases. So therefore, what's the maximum number of units that she will consume if the price of X is 50? So let's look here. Let's think about one. Well, she's consuming one unit. It costs five units. Therefore, uh, she's getting 10. We know that the, 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 the kind of utility of a dollar is two is two units of utility. So she's losing 10 units of utility, but gaining 30 units of utility from good. Therefore, uh, five, uh, therefore two units of utility, sorry, because it's one, one, uh, five, um, five to 10 units of utility, because you've got five dollars is how much this, uh, good costs, good X costs. Um, because you one. We know that each dollar is two units of utility, so that's, that's, uh, 10 units, and so she's got, she gains 20 units of utility, 20 units of utility. What about here? Well, 50 units of utility, she's buying two, uh, costs 10, ten dollars. Uh, therefore, she's losing 20 units of utility, but we know she's getting 50 units, that's fine. We're looking for the point where the unit cost, cost in utility terms of purchasing these units goes above the uh, utility. So let's look here, at, uh, kind of assessing our answers, let's look at A or 3. So is she going to purchase 3? Well, she would purchase 3, we can run that cake measure, but let's see 4. We've got 4. She's purchasing four of the units, she's spending twenty twenty dollars. Uh, we therefore know that the uh, it's it's two two units of utility from the last dollar spent. Therefore, we know that uh, she's kind of spending forty units of utility, but that's still ahead. What should we go to here? Well, let's look at five. So if she consumes five units of utility. She's spending. An extra five, right? So four to five is costing her an extra five dollars. So another 10 units of utility. Each time she goes up, she's getting 10 units of utility. And the marginal utility here. So the gain in utility is the difference between 75 and 80. It's only five. So she's spending more than she's gaining on that extra unit. You know? So four is going to be massive. Here we want to be thinking about marginal utility. So how much utility is gained? Here it's 20, here it's 15, 10, here it's five. At that point, the extra quantity spent is 10, and it's more. So she's not going to consume that 50 units. So four units is the maximum there. Sorry for that long-winded explanation. Question three. In the diagram, the consumer's budget line shifts from GH to GK. GH there, G and JK there. Why, which statement must be correct? Well, we know what's happened from GH to GK. Well, J's become more expensive, and good X's become less expensive. 
So all we know is that the price of good X, so she can buy less of good, sorry, good X is a more, but she can buy less than she had nil units. And she can now produce, because she's more of good Y. So good Y has become cheaper, good X has become relatively more expensive. So what do you know? Well, the price of good X has increased relative to the price of good Y. That is absolutely true. We know that. The price of good, both goods can't have fallen. There has not been an increase in consumer real income necessarily. We can't conclude that. There might have been. And we also can't conclude that there's been an increase in the consumer's money income. Those are inconclusive statements. It might be the case, but they're not definitely true. Whereas the relative price change because of the pivot definitely is true. Question four. The short run production function in the diagram shows the relationship between the total product of labor and labor hours worked, TPL. And here we go, labor hours worked. So what is held constant when drawing this function? Well, being held constant here is clearly the stock of capital. We need to think about what's not on this relationship and what goes into the kind of productive relationship. So what do you put in? Well, you put in labor, you put in capital. Those are the two facts of production that can be varied, labor and capital. And we know that output here is also being varied. So what's being held constant? We're think about what's being left out. And it's very clearly the stock of capital. So that relies on you knowing that the, the output relationship, that you're in two inputs at labor, your pr uh, productive uh, inputs at labor and capital. And if one of them is on the diagram, it has to be being held fixed. Question five. What is a particular example of a wage differential that compensates the advantages associated with particular jobs? So what we're trying to think about is a, play, is a job where workers working in a different environment are kind of compensated more. They're getting more. So wage rises negotiated by trade unions to exceed those of non-unionized workers. Not really. So there aren't really any disadvantages to being unionized. And therefore, you actually get an advantage, you get a higher wage. We're looking for something that's kind of compensatory. Government office workers being paid more than private sector office workers. Well, they're not really being compensated for anything. They're just being paid more. It's not really better to work in the government office necessarily. There's no more risks or anything they're being compensated for. It's not worse, so they're being paid more. Labourers on offshore oil rigs earning more than those employed onshore. Clearly being an offshore oil rig is, for want of a better word, a pretty shit life. You live offshore, it's pretty dangerous, it rains a lot, you're away from your family, etc. If you, you have to earn more to compensate, to encourage you to do that. There's less people want to do it. You don't really want to work on offshore. It's not a great working environment. So you're paid more than those employed onshore who are able to live at home with their families, etc. Another example might be paying more workers to work in a kind of a less nice environment. OK, now we're thinking about this. So to increase the labour force from 30 to 31 workers, we have a situation where an entrepreneur is forced to increase the daily wage rate from 40 to 41. So we're thinking, what is the marginal cost of labour per day? So here we're increasing the daily wage rate here by a dollar for everyone. And to employ an extra worker. <coughs> so to employ that extra worker, we're going to have to pay them $41 anyway. That's the full price of one. But for all the 30 workers previously, we're also going to have to pay them an extra dollar. That's 30 plus 31 plus 30, 30, so the $1 each for all these 30 workers, plus the 31st worker's entire wages at $41 gives you a total of 71. If you increase another worker, it's going to cost them $71. Question seven. The workers in a firm have not previously belonged to a trade union, but now join one. In which circumstances is this most likely to raise their wages? So the firm's demand for firm's labor product is price and elastic. Well, if they then what happens when people demand more wages? Well, firms have to pay more wages. What does that mean? Well, it means the firm's costs have gone up, right? So in order to compensate for the increase in costs, they're going to have to charge a higher price for the product or make less profit. Firms don't like making less profit. They like charging more. So if the price is inelastic, right, for the good, demand is inelastic, they charge more, people are still going to buy it. So that's kind of a good, that kind of in, implies that the firm has room to move the price and not make losses. The firm can raise the price, Therefore, the trade union demanding higher wages is in a stronger position, right? So it's likely to, wear, to raise their wages when the firm can do so. And for that, their demand needs to be price elastic. Question eight. Here we have, let's just check it. I have a panic. There we are recording. Good. Here we've got kind of a diagram showing the relationship between output and number of workers employed at different levels of capital stock. So this is when you have four, this kind of level of capital, that level of capital. You can see as we increase the number of level of capital, you get more output per worker. So what's this diagram showing? Well, we're clearly here able to vary number of employed. We're also able to vary capital. So we're not holding any factor of production fix. And what's the definition of the time period in which we're not a period where we're not holding any factor of production fix? Well, 
That's the long run, right? But in the long run here, we're not holding any batch of production fixed. And therefore, the firm's long run production function uh, is being represented by this graph. Which diagram shows the marginal cost of providing a service where the total cost of production in the short run are fixed? So we're thinking about a point where we have uh, fixed short run costs and the short run marginal cost of providing a good or service. So we know something's fixed and it's clearly here, MC. The marginal cost is constant, right? The marginal cost is the same for each good. It's fixed providing a service and the total cost of production, the short run are fixed. So we're looking at simply a flat MC, right, at zero. A. Ten. Which is a financial economy of scale? So an economy of scale is a cost saving or a reduction in costs uh, on account of the firm getting bigger. A financial economy of scale is where the firm can borrow costs. They can borrow cheaper because they're a bigger firm. Barclays, because they're such a big firm, tends to get a better rate of borrowing money than a lot smaller bank. So here we're looking for something that represents that. And it's clearly lower costs in raising capital. You can clearly borrow more money, raise more capital at a lower cost if you're a bigger firm because of financial economy of scale. Simple definitional question there. Question 11. Here we have a diagram showing a firm's average revenue curve. Nice AR curve there. What can be deduced from the average revenue curve about the firm's total revenue as it increases output? Well, we know here that it will rise initially, right? Because what we need to know is we know about costs. We've got an average total cost curve. So because it's falling, we know that it's going to fall at some point to zero. And that's going to, there's still going to be costs at that point. So we know that initially we assume that AR is going to be higher, right? <coughs> and costs, which are probably likely to be something here. <coughs> and then eventually costs are falling, right? As you produce more, your average costs are going down. So you're spreading it more evenly. So though it will initially rise, it's eventually going to fall. Question 12. What's an assumption underlying the key demand curve in an oligopoly? Okay, so in an oligopoly, what we tend to have, and I'm going to see if I can get a diagram of this up, because it might be easier for me to explain. Right, here we go. Lovely. Ooh, here we go. Right. So in an oligopoly, what we tend to see is we tend to see a demand curve that looks a little bit like that. A kink in the demand curve, it changes its um, slope at different points like this, Q1. The reason for this is simply because uh, rivals are expected to match any reduction in price. So if you reduce your price, right, it's going to be matched. And that's what that's by definition what results in the kink demand curve. I'm happy to explain that more. Um, it'd be worth looking up a video. There's actually an excellent video on YouTube. If you type in kink demand curve oligopoly explanation, you'll explain. If you have any questions on that, do let me know. Question 13. At its current level of output, a monopolist is on the price inelastic part of its demand curve. What would happen to price and output if it maximized profits? So it's in price inelastic, right? And if it's price inelastic, it can raise price and it's not going to see a massive fall in demand. It's going to increase revenue. So what can it do? Well, it can there, at that point, it can increase its price, right? Because maximizing profit. And then it can decrease its output, right? But that's what you want to do. You want to massively boost your price to monopoly max profit maximization levels. And that's going to see a reduction in output. And then you're going to sell less units. You're going to price them even higher than you originally were. And because it's inelastic, right, you're going to get an overall um, you're going to get an overall um, increase in revenues and profits. Question 14. In many countries, laws exist which prohibit firms from copying innovations introduced by other firms. What is the economic reason behind these laws? Well, countries don't want people stealing other ideas, right? You have patents, they're called. They're called patents, patents. They're restrictions on people kind of if you invent something, you can get a patent and then no one can produce it for another five years, ten years. So you're the only one who can make money off it. And the reason being is because if you put a load of money and effort into inventing something, you want to be the only one who can sell it. You want monopoly power. And it's one of the incentives to get people producing. You have to introduce this kind of type of monopoly power in order for people to be able to, well, innovate. Otherwise, no one's going to want to do it. So what's the case we see here? Well, in this case, the degree of monopoly power is clearly very helpful in achieving technical progress. Right. The degree of monopoly power doesn't help achieve that. efficiency. It's definitely wrong. Research development is guest conducted by government organizations. That's no reason to prevent people from copying innovations. 
The prices of goods produced by monopolies need to be regulated. Well, we're not doing that. Clearly, B is actually the only option. And as I've just explained, it's actually the, the reason. Question 15. Which policy change will make some individuals better off without making any worse off? Right? So we're looking for something that allows for greater improvements. So in introducing a national minimum wage does not make anyone worse off. It make, does not make everyone better off. It makes firms worse off. They've got to pay people more. Free bus travel for those over 60. You've got to pay for that somehow. So it's probably going to make some individuals better off, those over 60, but it's going to make people worse off. Maybe bus drivers who might not get as much revenue of people driving on their buses. Councils who have to spend more money and taxpayers who have to fund this increase. What about removing restrictions on opening hours of supermarkets? Well, it's clearly not going to make the people who work in the supermarkets better, right? They're going to have to work harder and it's going to increase costs for supermarkets and stay open. So it's not going to make everyone better off. But we're looking for something where you've simply got trade. Trade is a Pareto improvement where someone has something that they don't want and someone has something they do that and if someone else wants something that someone else has, they don't want, they can trade and it makes everyone better off. So we're looking for that kind of trade or buying and selling environment, bartering environment. And one of these things is in milk quotas. When you set a quota, some people clearly won't need to produce as much as the quota. If you say I can produce 150 tons of coffee a year and I'm only able to produce 100, what good is it me having the ability to produce 50 more tons if I can't do it? Another firm might say, well, I can produce 200. I've got loads of lads. I can produce 200 tons, but I'm only allowed to produce 150. What if the person who had that spare capacity was able to tell the guy, well, hey, mate, you want to produce 200. I've got spare 50 here. I'll give you the spare 50 if you give me 100 quid. Clearly, that's a Pareto improvement. Everyone's better off. No one's any worse off. Because the quota remains the same. The amount of coffee being produced is still exactly the same as it was before. It's just that you're spreading the, you're kind of, instead of evenly distributing it, you're evenly distributing it and then allowing people to trade it for money. So clearly, allowing farmers to buy and sell milk quotas is what we call a Pareto improvement. It makes individuals better off without making anyone else worse off. <coughs> Sorry. Question 16. Here we have a good giving rise to external benefits and it's produced under conditions of monopolistic competition. If it's being produced, what do we know? Well, if it gives rise to external benefits and it's being produced, social benefits must exceed private benefits. That's a definition of an external benefit, right? If there's external benefits and it's being produced, the social benefits must exceed the private benefit. That's just the definition of external, external benefits existing. A pretty easy question there. Question 17, we've got a woman joining the labour force earning a salary of 25,000 a year. Per annum is a year. Her partner already earns 18,000 per year. A couple pay a childminder 8,000. It's a very progressive question. Women earning more than that. Good. I'd like to see that earning that. A couple pay a childminder 8,000 a year to look after their baby. What would be the increase in GDP? Well, what's the increase in GDP? Well, she joined, the, the, the 18,000 per annum doesn't factor into our GDP point, okay? That's already there in GDP. We're looking for increases. So what's going to be an increase? Well, it's 25,000 per annum is earned. And then the couple take 8,000 8, of that and pay a child minor, who then earns 8,000. Both of those increase GDP, remember. But though the 8,000 is coming directly out of this 25,000 and 18,000, it's still an increase in GDP. This is part of the multiplier effect. So all we're really looking to do is say this 8,000 plus 25,000 is increase in GDP equals 33,000. Question 18. A central bank is purchasing government securities as part of a policy of quantitative easing, which is where the government increases its money supply by buying, basically, selling government bonds. What is likely to be the effect on interest rates and the supply of money? Well, we're likely to see interest rates go down, and we're likely to see money supply go up, in this case. The reason being, so when you have quantitative easing, interest rates go down because the government's flooding it with cheap bonds, and therefore there's a reduction in interest rates. That's the price of interest rates is the is the price in the uh, market for loanable funds. You see an increase in loanable funds, so increase in supply is going to drive the price down. It's what we call crowding out. Interest rates go down. Right, money supply. Well, quantitative easing is a way of increasing the money supply. You're selling more kind of government bonds on the market. Therefore, we're going to, just knowing what quantitative easing is, the supply of money is going to increase. Question 19. An econ economy is operating at its natural rate of unemployment. So economies have a natural rate of unemployment. And this is something I'm happy to explain more. Diary, natural adjusted inflation rate of unemployment. Uh, something that's a little bit more common. That's a university level concept, but there is this natural rate of unemployment in the economy. According to monetarist theory, what would be the effect of an unanticipated increase in the money supply and unemployment in the short run and in the long run? Well, in the long run, there's going to be no change, right? No change in unemployment. Everything gets back to equilibrium. 
But if you suddenly have an unanticipated increase in money supply, firms are going to have more money to spend. They can pay more people. And therefore, we're going to get a reduction in unemployment in the short run. So the economy improves in the short run, but in the long run, it adjusts just as well. <coughs> in an economy in which there is full employment, the marginal propensity to consume a pensioners is greater than that of taxpayers. So pensioners spend more money. If you decrease the government expenditure on pensions, you give pensioners less money, what's going to happen? Well, we know that the marginal propensity to consume a pensioners is greater. So if you give a pensioner a pound, they're going to spend more of that than taxpayers who are likely to save. Now we've, they flip this question on its head, which is going to be the complicated part, because we're now decreasing pensions. If we increase pensions, we'd see a positive multiplier. But because we're decreasing pensions, we're going to see a negative multiplier. So the reduction uh, to maintain full employment, so the reduction is going to be greater than 20 billion, right? We're going to see a greater billion reduction because the people who are getting the kind of cut in government spending, right? The decrease in expenditure on pensions. They would have spent more. So we've got to have a greater than 20 billion loss. So therefore, to maintain unemployment, we need to give these people, the taxpayers, a lot more than 20 billion because of their lower marginal capacity to consume in order to compensate for that. And the way we give taxpayers more money is we basically cut their taxes. So we're going to have to reduce their taxes by more than 20 billion in order to compensate for that decrease in pension contributions from the government. Question 21. Here we have a table showing some data for an economy. Let's get the people looking nice. There we go. What do we have? Well, we're looking for the equilibrium level of national income. OK, so what we have here is. OK, so what we want to know is we want to differentiate this table into what's a positive on the national income account and a negative. OK, investment, positive, negative, positive, exports, neg uh, positive on the income account, government expenditure, positive. Savings, negative, bad. Imports, bad. Taxation, bad. National income, what this overall. So we know that this figure, 700, 800, 900, 1,000, has to equal plus, 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 minus that. OK? So what we want to do is we want to equal them out. And we know that that occurs when national, we know that national income, that's going to occur when 100, 170, and 130 is equal to 400. That equals 400. Therefore, the only point in national income at which these two sides are equal, savings, imports, and taxation equals public expenditure and investment, is at the point where national income is 900. So that's our equilibrium level. For the others, it doesn't work. 22. Assuming a constant velocity, income velocity of circulation of money, these questions always come up. The rate of inflation is 10%, and the rate of growth money supply seven percent what's the approximate change in the value of national output it's simply the rate of inflation sorry it's simply the money supply the greater growth of money supply minus the rate of inflation which is minus three therefore minus three percent that's just a patch of no equation to be accounted learn that equation 23 the diagram shows two liquidity pressures demand curves for money these the money supply is m and the initial equilibrium rate of interest is r what could have caused a fall in the rate of interest from R1 to R2? So what could it have been? Well, it could have been a shift from L. We need a shift from L. Oh, we need a shift from LP to LP2. Remember here, it's there. We want to see what goes and puts the rate of interest down to R2. What causes a shift in the liquidity preference of money? Well, an increase in unemployment would. People are demanding more money. Uh, they're not earning as much. Uh, there's less like kind of need for money in the economy. Therefore, liquidity preference demand curves are going to shift to the left. An increase in unemployment, you need something bad to happen. Bad to happen. Um, that's going to what's going to shift LP1 to LP2. Learn reasons for shifting your LP curves. I'm happy to talk about those as well. 24. What would be most likely to increase the country's long run trend of growth? The long run trend rate of growth. A reduction in the ratio of government debt to GDP is the answer. Let's talk about why. Well, what we're looking to do is increase this kind of long run trend. We want sustainable growth. The appreciation of the currency is going to do it in the short run, right? An increase in import tariffs is not going to help. An increase in the money supply equally might do it in the short run. We're looking for something that's really going to affect us long run. And the ratio of government debt to GDP, so reducing debt, we know helps long run trends of growth. Reason being, it instills more confidence in the economy. The government can, uh, has less pressure. It can spend more on kind of less on debt repayments and more on kind of services and helping to grow the economy. So reducing that ratio and getting it under control is really important for long-run trends of growth. 
2025. We've got a chart showing the rate of growth of the economy and unemployment in a country for the period 2007 to 2010. So what does this chart show? Well, here we've got our percentage change in real GDP. And we can see that that's kind of increased, increased and then fallen. And the percentage rate of unemployment is going down, down, down and then up. So we can see that unemployment is falling as GDP is rising. And the minute GDP falls, unemployment goes up. So the unemployment fell, rate fell, when the growth rate increased. That's what we can show, see from the chart. Simple, simple analysis, simple explanation. Question 26. The number of people employed in a country and the level of unemployment both go down. What could explain this? So what, this is a bit perplexing. So you've got more people employed going, uh, is going down. And we've also got less people being unemployed. So we want to think about what takes people out of kind of the level of unemployment. So we've got more people being employed in the economy. Also, the number of people being employed in the economy, in the country going down, right? So we're thinking about people leaving the workforce. That's what it is. It's people leaving the workforce and not trying to work. And what that is, is they're not doing work. They're either retiring or they're going into education. So here, an increase in the number of students definitely explains the number of people employed in the economy, the country going down and the level of employment going down because just because the level of uh, number of people being employed in the country goes down, if they're just going into the unemployed sector, then that's, that means unemployment's going up. But if they leave the workforce entirely, they leave the labour market, they're not looking for a job, they're students, as it were, then that's suggesting that both of these things could happen. 27. Which combination of government interventions would be intended to support the lower income group? So we've got two different types of welfare payment systems here, means test universal. Universal just means you give that money to everyone, whether they're rich or poor. Clearly, that doesn't affect, help the lowest, the lower income anymore. We're not really trying to support the low income. Means test is where you give it out to people of a certain income. You're seeing who earns the lower level and giving them benefits. That's definitely helpful. So we know it's going to be A or B. Also, progressive tax system. Well, progressive tax system is one that taxes the rich more than it taxes the poor and then uses that to redistribute. Good. <coughs> So progressive tax systems. So we already know it's going to be A. Type of subsidy isn't really that important, but if you wanted to argue it, you could say that subsidizing food, the food industry, drives food costs down, making it cheaper to live, and that helps poor people as well. That's the lower income group in the economy. But mainly it's because of this means tested welfare system and progressive tax systems. The government of a major trading country imposes a tariff on imported goods. What is the likely impact on prices paid to the foreign producers of goods and on the prices paid for goods by so you've got a tariff of imported goods. Prices paid to foreign producers, you pay them less for their goods because you've now got to pay the tariff on top of it. <coughs> so let's say you were buying a television from Japan, 200. There's an import tariff on it of another $200 or 200 quid. That takes it up to 400. You're unlikely to pay 400. You might only pay 300. You've still got to pay this tariff of 200. So the person, the company in Japan are going to have to cut their prices in order to keep the farm down. So what we're going to see is a decrease in the prices paid to foreign producers. What about prices paid by domestic consumers? Well, they're still going to see an increase because it's likely that uh, some of the tariff that the, producer, the people have to pay for import products is going to have to be paid by passed off, it's like a tax. We're going to see an increase in prices and a decrease in prices. And the tariff is kind of the wedge between that. The same way taxes work. 29. In which set of circumstances is an economy likely to experience both falling inflation and at the same time falling unemployment? Well, when do we see like inflation going down? It's when we have um, unemployment above the natural rate, firstly, and also this above the long term trend of growth. That's likely to see falling inflation. And falling unemployment also occurs when we have unemployment above the natural rate. because We want it to come back down to the natural rate. But also growth means more people are being employed in the economy. So clearly this combination A that's going to result in those two effects. Question 30. If the unemployment that exists in a country is judged to be mainly structural, structural unemployment is where there's something fundamentally wrong with the economy, and that's why we have unemployment. Which is the most effective policy the government can implement? Well, basically, structural unemployment is something like people don't, we need loads of people using computers in work. That's the kind of jobs we have in the economy. No one knows how to use a computer. So they can't be employed. That's a structural problem. That jobs and skills people can work at in the economy doesn't match up with what the economy actually needs and what the jobs are. So we're looking for something that kind of trains that. Not, it's not a problem of getting people into work. There's demand for labour and supply of labour. It's just they don't match. That's a structural problem. So by increasing subsidies for training, we're making training cheaper, making education cheaper, and we can now retrain all these workers who want to work 
and give them the skills they need to then work in the economy and match the skills they have to the jobs that are needed. So that's going to kind of reduce our structural unemployment. That's a quick run through of that paper. It's a little bit more tricky than the other paper, I accept. So so you'll probably have some questions. Uh, And yeah, drop me a message. I look forward to answering them. Let me just find out where my screen is. Thanks. Uh, Have a good evening. And let me know whether you have any questions.